Good morning, good morning, St. James. Good morning to our virtual family. We are so glad that you have joined us in our virtual sanctuary today. The Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. So I want you to take this time to like and share this worship service with your friends and your family so that we can all worship together. The Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So let us praise and worship together with the choir.
Guide us, O oh, thou great Jehovah, through this pilgrim land. We are weak, but thou art mighty. Hold us with your powerful hand. Would you join me and lift your hands as we pray this morning? We are gathered together in this moment, God our Father, Christ our Savior, because we are thankful for this day. For this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. We thank you, God, for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and allows us to come boldly to your throne of grace. For it is your grace and your mercy that sustains us every day. Forgive us of any sins or transgressions we may have committed by word, thought, or deed. We bow before you, O oh God, with hearts of praise. For you have looked beyond our faults and saw our needs and blessed us according to your riches and glory through the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask in Jesus' name for healing grace for the sick, saving grace for the lost, delivering grace for those in bondage, sheltering grace for the homeless, and comforting grace for the bereaved. We ask these things because your word tells us if we ask, it shall be given. God our Father, Jesus our Savior, we ask you to draw us close to you that we might feel your glory as we run this race of life. Oh Lord, we pray you will be our eyes and watch us where we go and help us to be wise in time when we don't know. God, let this be our prayer when we lose our way. Lead us to the place, guide us with your grace to a place where we will all be safe. Lord, let these words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight this day. Amen. people of God praised the Lord. I am excited today to introduce our preacher for the morning. Our preacher is none other than the Reverend Tyrone Emmanuel McGowan, and he is a prophet, a leader, a voice for this time. I met Tyrone as a student at Morehouse. We were both chapel assistants in the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, and I actually was his RA, uh, his resident assistant, when he first came to Morehouse as a freshman. And our friendship has endured since that time. He was in my wedding, and we are grateful for this long friendship. He serves as associate pastor at Trinity United Church of Christ, where he works with youth and young adults. He also serves as pastor of the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Robbins, Illinois. He has degrees from Morehouse College and Yale Divinity School, and has done much as a socially conscious minister to make true the beloved community and to make real God's kingdom here on earth. I am so excited to hear the word from Reverend Tyrone Emmanuel McGowan, and I know that upon hearing the word, you will be blessed. Won't you pray with him, pray for him as he brings the word of life after the singing of the next selection. The next voice you will hear will be that of the Reverend Tyrone Emmanuel McGowan. Let the church say, Amen.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be made glad in it. What a joy, what a privilege, what an honor it is, St. James, to be with you on this, the Lord's day, to share in this powerful series, Revolutionary Jesus. I'm so grateful to your pastor, Reverend Craig Thomas Robinson and his lovely wife and assistant pastor, the Reverend Dr. Shakira, Sanchez Collins for their warm invitation to be with you on today. I thank God for their friendship and their extraordinary leadership, how they have just been here now, I believe a year, and they are just taking this ministry to higher heights. And for that, we just give God all the glory, honor, and praise. This is an important series at such an important time in our nation's history. Uh, based off uh, a book that means so much to me in my life and my development, The Politics of Jesus by Dr. Obrey Hendricks. I have reread this book in preparation for this series and we are leading our young adults at Trinity uh, in this series as well, The Politics of Jesus. And today I have the honor of sharing uh, the fifth political strategy of Jesus that Hendricks talks about in his book, which is save your anger for the mistreatment of others save your anger for the mistreatment of others. And so I invite you today to join with me in the gospel according to Luke, the gospel as recorded by the writer Luke, Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five, beginning at verse 17 and culminating at verse 26, Luke chapter five, verse 17, culminating at verse 26. Today I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Listen now for the word of the Lord. One day, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. 
they were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees got angry and began to question, who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their anger and their questions, he answered them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say, stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up, take up your bed and go to your home. Immediately, he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on and went to his home glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen marvelous things today. For the few moments that I have to share with you on this Lord's Day, I just want to talk from this thought as the Spirit shall guide. It's already in the house. It's already in the house. Beloved, I believe the healing in this text is secondary. The issue in the text is not whether healing is possible. The issue, however, is accessibility and not possibility. For the text is clear, Jesus is in town and Jesus is in the house. And the Bible declares in verse 17 that the power of the Lord was with him to heal. So healing is possible. It's already in the house. This gospel story before us is about access and accessibility. It is a story about overcoming barriers and obstacles to achieve the healing and wholeness that is already available to us. The story then is not about possibility. It is a story about accessibility. The power and thus the possibility for healing, wholeness, and help was already in the house. But some folk could not get into the house in order to access that which was possible. In other words, uh, they could not get through the door. And as people of color, people who have been kissed by nature's son, we know what it means to struggle for access and accessibility. We know the frustrations of barriers and racialized bureaucracies and bondage and blockers who cannot deal with our blackness. It's not a question about our potential and our possibility and our power. It's about access to exercise our highest God-given potential. So that's why in just about every black church, you hear somebody proclaim one of the most fundamental components of our faith, that our God makes a way out of no way. That, 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 that God can open a door that no man can shut. That's the testimony, beloved, of a no way people. But you have to be in a no way and no win situation to know that God can make a way out of no way. It is a brilliant testimony that uh, radiates its bright light across the dark night of our gloomy past. We look to the God who makes a way out of no way because so often the door of opportunity has been slammed in our faces, seemingly limiting our purpose and our potential. 
And as Dr. Aubrey Hendricks in his brilliant and groundbreaking text, The Politics of Jesus, says that he says that we must respond with passion and righteous anger to every barrier that excludes anyone from the fullest fruits of our nation's bounty. Hendricks argues in this fifth strategy that we must always direct our righteous anger and our prophetic rage at any institution, any person, any policy, uh, any group that intentionally seeks to, to systemically exclude or limit the access of another based on their race, religion, creed, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, or any other political or social modifier. We must be outraged at the abuse, neglect, violence, and mistreatment directed at any of God's children. And we have a sacred and moral obligation to do all that we can to treat their needs as holy as we work to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, the Bible says that, that the power of the Lord was with him, was in the hands of Jesus to heal, but some folk could not get into the house to access the healing that was in the palm of his hands. And I don't know if there's anyone worshiping today online who's ever said, if I could just get there, if I could just get the opportunity, if I could just get the job interview, if I could just get in front of the seat of power, if I could just get my foot in the door only to get to the door and have the door closed on your foot. Anybody? Uh, worshiping today ever been pushed out or locked out or shut out or marginalized and messed over and, and I imagine today uh, in my sanctified imagination that that this is how these brothers in this text must have felt as they come now carrying their paralyzed friend uh, they are trying as best they can to get this brother to Jesus because they know that if they could just get him to Jesus, everything will be all right. Well, they make their way through the town and they make their way to this house, but, but folk were, were all over the house and, and all outside of the house blocking their way. That they arrive at the house only to discover people everywhere. Uh, some had gathered because perhaps they wanted to be cured that day. Others gathered because they were just curious. They wanted to see what was going on in that house. Uh, these brothers were there because they were in a desperate situation. That they were in a desperate and dismal situation because their friend, who perhaps was once vibrant and strong, once full of potential and possibility, had been stricken with paralysis. They were there trying to get help for a paralyzed brother. And their situation was desperate, uh, but there was on the horizon a glimmer of hope. Word on the street and word in the hood that day was that Jesus was in town. And it doesn't matter what you're going through today. It's good to know that Jesus is still in the neighborhood. Because if Jesus is in the neighborhood, uh, Jesus can meet my needs wherever they are. And if Jesus blesses my neighbor, some, some residue just might rub off on me. Uh, and I ought to get excited just because of the fact that Jesus is in the neighborhood. And if he's in the neighborhood, some things in the neighborhood can change. Whenever Jesus is in the vicinity, I'm talking about Jesus today, that, that rather unusual ophthalmologist who one day took some dirt and some spit and created contact lenses in less than three minutes and opened the eyes of the blind. I'm talking about Jesus who one day stood on the bow of a ship and spoke directly to the storm just by saying, 
three words, peace, be still. I'm talking about Jesus. Demons tremble at that name. Jesus, cancer cells dry up at that name. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Jesus, leprosy cowers at his command. Jesus, water is romance at the very sight of him and blushes into wine. Jesus, the one who woke me up this morning. Jesus, the one who started me on my way. Jesus, the one who sticks closer than any brother. Jesus, the one who picks me up when I'm down. Jesus, the one who calms my fears and dries my tears. Jesus, the bright and morning star. Jesus, the lily of the valley. Jesus, the rose of Sharon. Jesus, a lawyer, if you ever found yourself in a courtroom. Jesus, a doctor in a sick room. Jesus, the precious lamb of God. Jesus is in the house. And, and I just stopped by uh, to St. James AME today to remind somebody. Uh, pe people may have doubted you. Some people may have wrote you off. Some people may have counted you out. People may have tried to put a ceiling on your progress, but I stopped by today to remind you whatever you need is already in the house because Jesus is in the house. And because Jesus is in the house, joy is in the house. Salvation is in the house. Healing is in the house. Deliverance is in the house. Forgiveness is in the house. Liberation is in the house. Peace that passes all understanding is in the house. Power is in the house. Love is in the house. Restoration is in the house. The answer to your question and your prayers is already in the house. Jesus is in the house, and so whatever you need is already there. Well, I thank God that, that they made it to the house, but that's as far as they could get. The Bible says that, that there was such a massive crowd, such a great crowd there, and, and among the crowd, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, keepers of tradition. And, and, and every house, believe it or not, has some Pharisees in it. Some folk who are trying uh, to, to, to keep tradition, some, some status quo people. And every house needs tradition. But there's a difference between tradition and traditionalism. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with tradition. Thank God for tradition because tradition provides us with a firm foundation. It provides us a way, a methodology for us to operate in the world. Uh, it, it's traditionalism that's the problem. It's Jerusalem Pelican, that great church historian, who said that tradition is the living faith of dead men and women. But traditionalism is the dead faith of living men and women. And you ought to make sure that you are never paralyzed by traditionalism. This brother in the text was not the only brother paralyzed that day. There were some other folk in the crowd and in the house who were paralyzed. And the reason we know this is because when Jesus begins to speak life and wholeness into that brother's situation, they were not glad. They were not excited that this brother gets healed. You see, everyone won't be excited when God gets ready to move in your life. Everyone won't be celebrating when God blesses you. The Pharisees got mad. The Pharisees became indignant and they asked Jesus, who in the world do you think you are? Uh, don't, don't you know that you cannot do this? You cannot forgive sins. Only God and God alone can do that. The keepers of tradition began to say, who in the world do you think you are trying to heal this man on the Sabbath day? It, isn't that amazing? They, they questioned Jesus and said, uh, don't you know that, that on the Sabbath day, we, we don't expect anyone to be healed because it's the Sabbath day and, and we're just going through the motions. 
They, they wanted to keep up the barriers that prevented this man from being made whole. They said, we, we've come here just out of empty religious exercise. We've come here just to stand up when we're supposed to stand up and sit down when we're supposed to sit down. Uh, we, we've come here uh, because this is the socially acceptable thing to do before it's brunch time. Uh, we don't expect anybody to get healed. We don't expect anybody to be transformed. We don't expect anyone to be liberated. We don't expect anyone to be set free because this is the Sabbath day. And it's dangerous, beloved, when, when people of faith lack the ability to expect God to move in their lives. It's dangerous when people of faith lose the capacity to expect a miracle in their life. But I thank God for the witness of these brothers because they were determined that come hell or high water, uh, they were gonna get their friend inside of that house to Jesus. They were determined to break down any barrier, any wall of exclusion that prevented them from seeing Jesus. They were determined to get into the presence of Jesus by any means necessary because in his presence, there's fullness of joy and life forevermore. In his presence, there is liberty. And I don't know about you, uh, but I don't care how down I'm feeling. All I need to do is, is get into his presence. I just need to be in his presence. Even if I can't make it to the house, I just need to be in his presence. During this pandemic, we haven't been able to physically gather in the house, in the sanctuary. But if you are serious about getting into God's presence, God will transform your car into a sanctuary. God will transform your kitchen and your living room into a sanctuary. God can transform your jail cell into a sanctuary. All I need to do is be able to get into God's presence. Whatever you do, oh Lord, just don't take your spirit away from me. I need to be in your presence. I need to feel your presence, peace, and your power. I need the presence of the living God every day and every hour. Let me feel your cleansing power. I just need to be in your presence. So, so they decide that, that, that they're going to get this brother to Jesus. They get to the house, but the door is locked. Uh, it is blocked by, by other folk who are already in the house. And, and with all of your hangups and with all of your issues, be careful that you are not blocking other folk from getting into the house to see Jesus, from getting into the presence of the Lord. So, so they got to the house, but they were not able to get inside the house. But I thank God today because uh, these were some, some around the way brothers. In, in my sanctified imagination, uh, that these were some brothers from the hood with, with some hood tendencies. They, they, they were saved, but they were not fully delivered yet. Uh, and so, so when they encountered a blocked door or a locked door, that didn't stop them because they had seen blocked doors and locked doors before, but that never stopped them from getting to where they wanted to go. Uh, they knew uh, that when, when they couldn't get through the door, all they needed to do was go get some rope and go down the street uh, because somewhere somebody had thrown out an old mattress and they laid that brother on that old mattress and they took some rope and went up the fire escape and each brother carried his corner of that mat and they lifted him up and let him down into the house so that Jesus might lift him up. In other words, they said blocked doors and closed windows cannot stop us. 
If you block the door, we'll unlock the door. If we can't get through the door, we'll come through the window. If we can't come through the window, we'll come through the roof. We'll tear the roof off this place in order to see Jesus. And I wonder if there's anybody watching today, worshiping online, uh, who's, who's, who has that type of faith, uh, that faith that cannot be stopped. A by any means necessary type of faith, a faith that says with God, all things are possible, a faith that says if God be for me, who can be against me, a faith that says no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper, a faith that says what God has for me is for me, no matter who or what gets in my way. I don't care how you look at me. I don't care if you look at me funny. I'm going to bless God anyhow. I'm going to praise God anyhow. I need to be in the presence of the living God. I just want to be where he is. That's what I like about these brothers. They do whatever it takes to get their friend into the presence of Jesus. They remove any and all barriers that will block his healing and restoration. They form a coalition of conscience, a community of compassion. They formed a radical fellowship of faith and together they brought this brother to Jesus. So they show up, they tear the roof off the house and the Bible says that Jesus looks up and he was so moved by their faith that on the basis of their faith, uh, he says, uh, brother, you have uh, been made whole. Your sins have been forgiven. And this is where the Pharisees get upset with Jesus. Now, if you think about it, that's a strange statement for Jesus to say. Your uh, sins have been forgiven because the man did not come there for forgiveness. He came there for healing. Uh, yet Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. You see, in ancient uh, Jewish tradition, uh, uh, it is believed that, that if one had serious illness, it was assumed that sin was the cause of it. Remember when Jesus encounters a brother who was born blind back in John chapter 9, the first question that the church folk asked are Jesus who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus says, y'all missed the point. Uh, this is done so that God might be glorified in him. Asking who sinned misses the point. We already know who sinned. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus says your sins are forgiven. In other words, you are not who the world says you are. You are a child of the living God. You are created and saved in the image of of a loving and liberating God. The world says you are nothing and will never amount to anything, but I'm here to tell you that you have a spark of the divine on the inside of you. You see, if you hang out in his presence long enough, you'll discover that you are the child of the living God and your sins have been forgiven. You are more than what the world wants to reduce you to. You are more than some stereotype. You are more than your worst mistake. God looks beyond your faults and supplies your needs. God has already forgiven you. This brother was paralyzed physically, but he was also paralyzed spiritually, mentally, and emotionally by what he had internalized. Years of being looked down upon, years of being stepped over, years of being ignored, years of being told he was nothing, years of being told that he must have done something wrong in order uh, for his body to be that way, years of being told it was his fault, years of having a cap placed over his progress as a child of God. And once Jesus spoke to the root cause of his sickness, his sickness was, was stigma and shame. And after Jesus spoke to the stigma, it was easy to speak to the symptoms. And everybody gets excited when Jesus says to the man, take up your bed, rise up and walk. What they don't know is that the miracle happened earlier in the sentence. When Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. In other words, if you free your mind, the rest will follow. 
If you would ever make up your mind that you are a child of the living God, then eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of women and men the good things that God has prepared for you. So Jesus says, rise and take up your bed. And the Bible says immediately he got up. This brother probably hasn't uh, walked for a number of years. Uh, so he probably wasn't even sure he could walk. Uh, but something welled up inside of him and got him up walking. But not only was he able to rise up and walk, the Bible says that he had enough strength to pick up the bed on which he had been lying. You see, uh, he just wanted to walk again. Uh, that was his prayer, Lord, help me walk again. But when you've been in his presence long enough, he will bless you with something you didn't even know to ask for. He will give you power you didn't even know you had in the first place. Jesus says, man, take up that mat on which uh, you have been lying on and carry it because some folk will not believe that you have been completely healed. But not only will I strengthen your legs, I will add strength to your whole body. I'm done today, but, but the Bible says that he went home glorifying God, that he went home praising God. He went back home to his wife and his children, giving God glory. When you've been in his presence long enough, there, there's a song that says you won't leave here like you came in Jesus name. Uh, he, he, he came into his presence having to be lowered from the roof laying on the mat. But now he can walk out the door that they wouldn't let him in carrying the mat that once carried him. If you come into his presence expecting a miracle, if you come into his presence expecting to be healed, if you come into his presence expecting deliverance, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name, bound, oppressed, afflicted, sick, or lame. For the power of the Lord is still the same. So you won't leave here like you came. I won't leave here like I came. We won't leave here like we came in Jesus' name because it's already in the house. To God be the glory today for the great things, the mighty things, the marvelous things that only our God can do. God bless you today, St. James. You will not leave here the way you came in Jesus' name. What a powerful message from Reverend Tyrone Emmanuel McGowan. I know that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in cyberspace. It is our invitation to Christian discipleship. The doors of the church are open. This is the opportunity for you, whoever you are, wherever you may be, to become a follower of Jesus Christ. We want you to make a decision today that Jesus is the example, Jesus is the source of your strength, the strength of your life, and you want to follow him. You can do that by going on our website, stjamesamechicago.com, and going on Become a Member. You, we would love to connect with you there. You can also let us know in the comments. Please let us know in the comments if you are making a decision for Jesus Christ, if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We also invite you to become a part of this family of faith, St. James AME Church in Chicago. No matter where you are in this city, this state, this country, or even the world, you have a place here at St. James. And if you have prayer requests, we invite you to also uh, make your prayer requests known either in the comments or on our website. Let us pray together, my brothers and sisters, as we look to God to help us to make this decision. Use my words, but use your faith. God, in Jesus' name, we thank you that everything we have, everything we need is in the house because you are in the house and you have everything under control. And so, God, we invite you 
to come into our heart, come into our soul, take up residence in us so that we might be the type of disciples that you need for us to be in this world. We believe, God, that you are in control. We believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who came to save us. We believe that you raised him from the dead. We believe, dear God, that we have power from on high. So God, we thank you. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for making us brand new. We thank you for healing us. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, and you have made a decision for Jesus Christ, you've made a decision to become a follower of Jesus or to join St. James Church, you can let us know in the comments. Please let us know in the comments or reach out to us on our website, stjamesamechicago.com. I am excited to go on this journey of faith with you and may God bless you as we journey forward. It's offering time, church, and God loves a cheerful giver. There are three ways to give here at St. James. You can go to our website, stjamesamechicago.com, and give using PayPal or Givelify. You can also mail tithes and offerings to St. James AME Church, 9256 South Lafayette Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620. We thank you for your generosity. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you this morning thanking you for another opportunity to give to your church, to give to your temple, to provide for your people. Dear Lord, we thank you for what you have provided us financially, spiritually, physically, and emotionally, God. And we thank you in advance for continuously allowing us to bless your kingdom. So be with us all. Strengthen us and protect us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And the people of God together say it. Amen. What a blessed service that we had today. We want to thank again our friend, our brother, Reverend Tyra McGowan, for bringing that word that we needed to hear today. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us, for us worshiping together today. And if you are still looking for a church home, we invite you to join the faith family here at St. James Amy Church in Chicago. Again, you can let us know right in the comments or you can email us, go to our website at stjamesamechicago.com. And we invite you to continue to join us to worship every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook, on YouTube, and also on our website. So now let us have the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Hence now and forevermore. And let us all say amen, amen, and amen. Go in peace, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.